Welcome. Uh, welcome to our panel. Uh, the theme of our panel is mindfulness-based interventions for health promotion and disease prevention. Uh, my name is George Wang, uh, and I'm not Shi Hong Wang, as it says in the brochure. <laughs> so uh, I apologize for this because I'm not a person that the audience is really intended to watch. But uh, happy. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you that uh, we have three distinguished experts sitting here, and they are the ones that the committee intended to invite. Uh, so, uh, just a brief reminder of the format of the panel. We have um, 20 minutes for each uh, session, so we'll save all the questions until the end of the three presentations. Uh, and to my left is Dr. Mick Fassman, uh, Dr. Carl Fulweiler, and Dr. Steve Kinney. <laughs> So let me start by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Meg Krasner. Dr. Krasner has practiced primary care internal medicine for nearly 25 years, and for the past 17 years has studied and facilitated mindfulness-based interventions in healthcare settings. She has engaged over 1,800 participants, medical students, physicians, and other health professionals in mindfulness-based interventions. His research includes investigations on the effect of mindfulness training on the brain and the immune system in the elderly. He co-developed a mindful practice curriculum at the University of Rochester School of Medicine, where it has become a required part of medical student training for the past eight years. He was the principal investigator of a mindful communication program for, for primary care physicians. He has presented and taught nationally and internationally <laughs> on the topic of mindfulness training of physicians and other health professionals. And he describes his efforts as being focused on improving health professional resilience and well-being for the purpose of improving quality of care and quality of care. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Krasner. Thanks, George. And uh, I want to give a shout out to Lisa and Nepora for the invitation and just being uh, very helpful in my own schedule. Um, so it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to spend a little time talking about uh, some of the health related benefits that have been demonstrated at some level uh, with regard to mindfulness based interventions. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on that um, given our short time. A little bit about uh, a little more about what Ron had spoken about this morning, if you were in the morning session, about our intervention with health professionals. Now really working interprofessionally more than anything, uh, and we invite uh, many professions in, in to join us. But this is just a remarkable um, photograph here. You can see this tree, some of beautiful boughs of green on top here, and just sort of holding on and seeing, you know. So this is like, uh, in some ways a reflection of this resilience that is already uh, embedded within us. I mean, we're genetically endowed uh, to be resilient. And in fact, if we weren't challenged, uh, we wouldn't have survived. We wouldn't even be here. So the challenge is the other, the flip side to the resilience, the threat of burnout is actually uh, something that is good for us in some way. If one can think of it that way, maybe, in a, maybe holding it in a non-dualistic way. But sometimes we really do need some help. Um, and sometimes the help comes in a lot of different forms. Um, so I just wanted to talk a, a little bit about the interventions uh, and some of the evidence in a very, very broad uh, sort of overview, not in a lot of detail. The detail can be found. Uh, and I, I would probably uh, say that the research on this and the evidence is actually fairly rudimentary, you know, as far as evidence goes, and, and a lot of it is really pilot, and it's great to see uh, David speak this, uh, this afternoon about uh, sort of the correlations in, in the neuroimaging and the neurofunctionality and, and the neuroscience behind it, but, you know, again, it's the whole person. Um, when we talk about the whole person, you know, that's the word health that actually comes from that. And, um, you know, we're also speaking about disease, Pathology, the source of the word itself, you know, harkens to what to the suffering that we all encounter. So, also embedded within us is coming into this 
human form, and that's going to be part of our experience. So passionate, our passion is our suffering, the pathos, pathology. <clears throat> and uh, I think uh, it's been mentioned a number of times today about uh, the opportunity, the invitation, despite you know, the inner experience of wanting to run off the stage or feeling anxious or, or uh, not knowing what to do, is to actually turn toward that. Because actually it is that encounter with challenge from moment to moment to moment, which really uh, builds the resilience to allow us to go out and find food, and find shelter, and raise families, and uh, hopefully do good things in, in this life. But that, the word intimacy itself, uh, interesting if you look at the etymology of that, we're, we're talking about to make something known, to really look toward it, to have the curiosity to investigate. <clears throat> So I'll just in a couple of categories talk about uh, the health-related effects of mindfulness-based interventions in general. Um, they've mentioned the MBCT. It's, it's interesting, the MBCT uh, program, which he calls with a big M, it's mindfulness with a big M, uh, is now considered standard of care in the United Kingdom's National Health Service uh, pharmacopoeia, if you will, of treatment. So if you have three or more major episodes, episodes of major depression. So we're talk, talking about serious major depressed episodes and you're in remission and you live in the UK and you receive your health care from the National Health Service, that's the care you're going to get. You're going to have a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy intervention. At least that's the goal. The problem now is training enough people to deliver that because the evidence is, is very robust. And now, as David pointed out earlier, that there's the evidence that even uh, not recurrent depression, but even in the midst of some forms and some severities of depression, that there may be salutary effects of this kind of intervention. Um, anxiety, um, you know, compared to other treatments, the, the literature on anxiety uh, doesn't necessarily show an improved outcome with mindfulness, but there's some equivalency of, of, of many of the treatment modalities used for chronic anxiety. Um, PTSD, there's an interesting uh, article published in, I think it was JAMA in August of this year from University of Minnesota, working through a VA hospital. These were vets. Uh, if you look at the group of vets, uh, the vets came from many of the wars, unfortunately been in too many. Uh, the largest cohort of them were from the Vietnam era and showed that compared to a standard group therapy, which has been sort of the standard form of therapy given to these vets, in the system for PTSD, the uh, mindfulness-based intervention uh, was superior, clearly superior. Um, and then there's a lot of work in the eating disorders, and um, we have, actually have some experts here uh, about that. Chronic illness, um, lots of lots of uh, research data, sort of pairing or looking at some symptomatology, looking at markers of disease burden looking at quality of life uh, and chronic illness. And a lot of this work is done in the cancer centers and in the, with cancer diagnoses. And um, even I responded to a question earlier uh, in the morning, uh, the, work, the work out of the University of Calgary um, from Linda Carlson and Michael Speaker from many years ago you know, showed some improvements in this domain. One of the uh, correlations was what David sort of uh, just briefly talked about the tel telomer story, which I'll maybe say a little bit more. Um, in breast cancer survivors, uh, there seems to be some effect on uh, telomer, or breast cancer sufferers, let's say, on telomerase activity. Uh, our own work in Rochester, we have a center for mind-body research, which is based on uh, an immunological uh, model uh, coming out of uh, psychoneuroimmunology, and originally the founder of the program there, uh, a scientist named Bob Hader and in his lab and then that center developed about 10 years ago we've done work looking at uh, waning immunity in the elderly and the effects of mindfulness-based intervention. I have a number of uh, studies published looking at some of the inflammatory cytokine levels in, in the people who've gone through the intervention versus control in elderly, uh, independently dwelling people. Um, so you can look that up. Um, the chronic psoriasis, we actually you may have read about years ago, years ago, a study that John Kabat-Zinn uh, did on, on psoriasis and just the meditation um, 
guided meditations during the treatment for really severe forms of psoriasis. So we've sort of re redone that study uh, through our R01 grant, uh, just finished and are looking at data as clearly a treatment effect. We have an active control and we looked at mild degrees of psoriasis and inflammatory condition that seems to be um, it seems to be made worse by stress, a very prevalent condition that also involves increased cellular proliferation, a very interesting disease itself, um, showing improvements in uh, people who have had mindfulness-based intervention. That, that will be published out of our labs. Chronic pain syndrome, we could say that uh, in a lot of these interventions, and if you look at sort of what David was talking to us earlier about the the functional neuroimaging, what it says about uh, sort of shifting and reframing and, and just making executive functions with that uh, frontal area that uh, seems to become more robust in meditators, that there's a, it, it may help explain the different relationships that people develop to the experience of pain. So that in the early days of the studies that uh, Kabat-Zinn did back in the early years of the, of the stress reduction clinic when we talked about Pain, pain, as you measure by scores, would, would not really change, but people's quality of life would improve their relationship to the pain. So there's some relational aspect that may have to do with some of the things that you were showing us, David, in regard to that. Um, sleep disturbance. Our lab, actually, the, the Center for Mind-Body Research has a um, sleep specialist and sleep orientation uh, connected with the immune markers that we're looking at. And we've looked at um, PTSD in, in women uh, and, mind, and mindfulness-based intervention and sleep improvements uh, and have shown benefits in that domain. Sleep seems to be, poor sleep seems to be a, one of the mediators, uh, one of the biggest stressors that we experience that can trigger depression, anxiety, uh, and a whole host of other medical issues probably. Uh, I talked a little bit about this. Uh, I think on the next slide I'm going to maybe just briefly again summarize what David just went over briefly. Um, actually, acute respiratory infection, this is, this is an interesting one in which decreased gaze out of work, decreased symptomatology from just your common cold has been uh, reported. And um, the telomere uh, story, the, uh, the ends of our chromosomes are capped with, uh, with something that are called telomeres and the cellular death um, the loss of uh, ability to reproduce at the cellular level is associated with decreasing length of the telomeres. And we have an enzyme that helps repair telomeres. Uh, and that enzyme um, is called telomerase. And it's been shown, I think, as back as 2004 out of uh, Apple and Blackburn's lab. Blackburn won the Nobel Prize uh, for some of her work in San Francisco that uh, that survival uh, or uh, death from breast cancer, for example, is associated with some of the changes in the in the telomere length and in in predicting cell death. And that actually, telomere length uh, in women, I think, in this study in 2004, that they reported who had uh, very high stress life stories. Uh, it looked like nine to 17 years of life were taken off them based on their telomere they could predict based, compared to controls that didn't have that stressful life event situation. Um, and then there is now some uh, evidence out of the same lab, I think, again, you can think of it as pilot and very early that telomerase activity can increase with the mindfulness-based intervention. So helping to preserve our, the ends of our chromosomes and perhaps uh, prevent the aging, or slow down the aging. This says, uh, what's the next best medicine? You should laugh because uh, that's, that's the best medicine, right? Um, so I'm just going to again summarize the work that we've done uh, in Rochester with our uh, what we call mindful practice and Ron outlined what mindful practice is. Um, so to show you this painting and, and drawing. This is a painting that was uh, commissioned by Tate, uh, who Tate Gallery is named after, the Tate Modern is named after, and he wanted a painting to be. Uh, made, this is in the mid-19th century, of social importance of some sort. And so he commissions Luke Fields, who um, painted this painting, which you can't see very well on this copy here. There's a child here, you can see that. This is the physician, sort of uh, engaged, objective in some ways, in a, in a clinical way, but also 
concern. You can't see over here there's a, a mother and father. The mother has her head on the table with her hands over her head. And obviously, an emotional situation. The father's comforting the mother. Lou Fields himself uh, lost one of his children at a very young age to an illness, and he was so impressed by the presence that Rana described earlier today of the physician that um, he thought he this would be a socially important uh, painting. This, a friend of mine who had trained in Rochester, and he now teaches at Brown University, um, teaches in a, uh, in a clinic at the medical school, and this is a drawing of one of the children who comes to the medical school. This was in a, a piece in JAMA called The Cost of Technology. It was an opinion piece about three years ago. And there's a child about that age. They, they draw themselves bigger than everyone else, probably seven or eight-year-old girl who's, uh, whose mother's here holding a baby and then sister or brother or whatever. And what's, what's happening over here? This is actually the doctor. And um, so this really happy child, this is the normative experience now in the healthcare encounter of the visit to the doctor and what's the doctor doing. So, you know, as Daniel this morning was talking about this interpersonal effect in addition to the systemic and intrapersonal effect of the engagement aspect. You know, what's, what's, what's happening here? Betsy Toll, who uh, is so, was so taken by the story uh, because the doctor depicted was a resident of hers um, who she felt was the most humanistic, you know, trainee she's had in 20 years. Um, that she's going, she's trying to organize a conference to address uh, informatics and medicine on the, from a humanistic level, so it'll be interesting. You saw this earlier, this connection in the empirical literature between uh, burnout or let's say resilience on the flip side and poor quality of care, safety errors or quality, improved quality of care and then the quality of caring. What, what you as a, what we all as a, uh, as a person who goes to seek medical help um, experiences. There's connections there and that mindful practice could be right in the middle. So what we've conceptualized in our, in our intervention that's mindfulness-based is how to move people along the continuum from burnout to resilience. Um, okay. And so you can see here uh, you know, how to go from withdrawal to being present, exhausted to energized, defeated, feeling bouncing back, so on and so on, so on. I can read all the way, the treading water to, you know, just barely staying alive. Sometimes we have days like that, don't we, where we're just barely able to make it through, and then we say to ourselves, I'm sure glad that day's over. And then we wonder, well, if we only have so many days, you know, I'm not sure I want to just throw away a day like that. Um, this would be, um, you know, being told by the administration or whoever, you know, it's just another growth opportunity. Uh, versus welcoming change. So. And why should it matter? You know, because, uh, um, well, it looks like quality of care is impacted, uh, empathy, or, or connection, or sense of actually identifying, uh, empathy being within the suffering, empathos of the other person, um, avoiding uh, some of the cognitive pitfalls that uh, come up all the time and throw us off center. Uh, and maybe promoting a participatory relationship that actually is bi-directional and works. Um, this is out of uh, Hopkins, Erica Sabiga, who um, was mapping some of these cognitive errors, these sort of error categories, um, with some of the qualities of mindfulness. So I just wanted to put that up there because I think it's very helpful. How does this address some of the cognitive difficulties? For example, um, affective heuristic, that's a where you feel either positively or negatively about the person you're taking care of and how that can cloud your judgment and what are the qualities that would help us uh, remediate that problem. This was uh, Ron's definition earlier today and um, our mindful practice program, which uh, we now have uh, um, a number of, uh, we, we run some training retreats for or basically train the trainer education to use this in people's institutions and we're finding uh, ourselves traveling and people coming from all over actually the, the planet to do this so there's programs at medical institutions and medical schools now on about every continent uh, who are using this in their with their trainees and with themselves uh, 
and it involves the increased inquiry, the, the mindfulness, cultivation of mindfulness through mindfulness meditation and, and the use of narrative stories that uh, we're often part of, uh, but we don't have much opportunity to, there's never time to re just reflect upon them and just share them in a, in a non-judgmental and an open and receptive way or with an open and receptive partner. Um, that was already shown. That's just a be appreciative inquiry. Uh, it's, uh, it's a strength-based approach to change management. And the way that we use it is that when we're working with, uh, we, we do uh, this training in using themes. And when we're using a difficult theme, for example, um, uh, suffering. Or really, in a, in a medical encounter, there was just a huge amount of suffering. Um, you know, how is it that we talk about what are the narratives, the things that we've experienced that we would, could share? So we turn toward, we turn our attention toward what's working. Thinking of a time when we were involved in uh, with a family that was really suffering terribly from a situation, illness, or whatever. How did we work with that? How did we sort of help that along? What were the what were, what, what was that story about and sharing that. And it turns out it actually makes a difference. You know, so much of our medical orientation is problem. In fact, if you look at almost any medical record, it's going to have a problem list. Um, never have I ever seen in a medical record of a capacity list, you know, or a list that shows you know, some of the positive attributes. Um, so it's turning toward that. And then sharing this in a way uh, that matters. And then we published, so I just wanted to end with showing some of the, just an overview of the findings. Um, we had 70 doctors in this uh, year-long training program. It was uh, eight weeks of three-hour sessions, weekly a retreat, followed by monthly session. Um, we actually had no difficulty recruiting. It turned out that their burnout scores at baseline were quite poor. This was a stressed and burned out group of individuals with, with about 16 years in medical practice with a fairly high levels of burnout. Um, and this is really the bottom line. I won't show you all the numbers, but patient-centered attitudes improved. Empathy, psychosocial orientation, uh, well-being improved. Their burnout levels improved. Their mood and symptom scores improved. Uh, and then interestingly enough, we, we looked at personality thinking that there may be some people, uh, some personality types that would do better with this kind of intervention. This is a trait, we thought. And we had no idea that actually there'd be some shift in this uh, supposed trait called personality. Uh, and uh, conscientiousness was one of the uh, one of the ways in which it changed and increased and uh, increased emotional stability. Uh, and there seemed to be a mediation, and notwithstanding all the problems with measuring mindfulness through mindfulness scales. Um, but I think the final thing was the most interesting to us. There were three. We went back and asked this group of seventy physicians through structured interviews and then qualitative analysis, as David is mentioning, and we need to hear, hear what people's reflections are. Uh, what was it about the program that, you know, that moved them? And um, one was uh, their degree of isolation is huge, so this community, so that's a huge factor, I think, in any of the group programs that we have. I always like to mention, uh, you know, Anne Lamont writes, uh, in, in one of her books, she says, oh, my mind is like a bad neighborhood. I try not to go there alone. <laughs> so there's something about community. Um, the practices themselves, the sharing of stories, the meditative and contemplative practices. But the third thing was the most uh, difficult one, I think, to work with in the cu current culture of medicine. And it's really being in conflict about caring for oneself, about taking the time. A lot of conflict around that. And that's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krasner. Uh, Dr. Krasner actually has to catch a flight at 5.30, uh, so he, if you see him leaving at 4.15, you will know where he's heading. So I know, what, I know that I mentioned at the very beginning that we'll save all the questions at the end, but I just realized you guys Dr. Krasner is going to be leaving. If anybody has any burning questions for Dr. Krasner, I'll take one question right now. Otherwise, we'll move on to the for a while. And I'm sure we could, um, if you have any questions for Dr. Krasner, we could get you in touch with him. So Dr. Fulweiler is our next speaker. 
Uh, he is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Medicine and Medical, medical Director and Associate Director of Research at the Center for Mindfulness at the uh, University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Medical School. Uh, his research focuses on mindfulness interventions targeting emotional factors and health behaviors, as well as cultural adaptations of mindfulness for diverse populations. He is principal investigator on an NIH grant that uses neural imaging methods to target, uh, to identify neural targets and predictors of outcome for mindfulness-based stress reduction in people seeking to maintain weight loss. He is also part of a collaborative grant funded by the NIH Science of Behavior Change Initiative which seeks to ascertain mechanisms involved in health behavior change with mindfulness interventions. Dr. Fulweiler is director of the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program at the UMass Center for Mindfulness. Uh, please welcome <coughs> Dr. Fulweiler. I just want to start by congratulating you all on the success of this conference. Uh, it's exciting to see all the enthusiasm and, and the turnout here. So. Uh, good luck with your initiative. I, you've got, if you've got Lisa Mabora behind it, I think you're going to do pretty well. Um, so, I, I heard some, I heard voices. <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, um, uh, our work and, and set up why we're taking the approach that we are uh, for health behavior change, specifically around eating and weight loss and weight maintenance of weight loss. Uh, but focusing in particular on identifying these intervention targets, and I'll say more about what I mean. So, um, behavioral patterns account for uh, the biggest share of uh, uh, premature deaths or avoidable, preventable deaths in this country. And uh, among those causes, obesity and inactivity combined and smoking are by far the largest contributors. So there's a tremendous opportunity here for us to make a significant impact on public health by improving behavioral health interventions for these problems. Of course, overweight and obesity is a significant problem and it's getting bigger. Sorry, uh, couldn't avoid that one. Um, so, and it, uh, obesity is associated with many chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, uh, arthritis, even cancer, deadly diseases. Um, and our current interventions uh, mostly focus on diet and exercise, makes sense. But the results are mixed and modest. Uh, there's tremendous variability in results with weight loss. And uh, the best intervention that we have is the diabetes prevention program. And that had, you know, had outcomes in the range of three to six percent of lo uh, weight loss at 48 months. But importantly, for the majority of people and anyone who struggled with weight, or if you know people, you're close to people who have, they'll tell you that they've lost thousands of pounds over their lifetime, but they've gained them all back. And some people gain back more than they lose in a weight loss attempt. So what are we missing in addressing weight loss? Uh, I think uh, I would argue, and, and our group is focused on the idea that we're not providing enough help with stress and emotional factors associated with eating and addressing one's weight and keeping weight off. So what role might mindfulness play in this? We know that mindfulness is effective. We've got solid evidence, even using the most rigorous meta-analysis reviewed in JAMA two years ago by the Goyal et al. meta-analysis, that uh, mindfulness-based uh, programs are effective for reducing the symptoms of emotional reactivity, anxiety and depression, as well as pain. So that provides, I think, the rationale for uh, applying mindfulness to eating and weight loss. And uh, that's what we're focused on. But um, the question is, what's the state of the evidence now? Maybe it is helpful. This headline from the Harvard uh, Health publication would suggest that it is, but then again, maybe not. So this other press from about a year ago uh, suggested questioning whether mindfulness-based approaches are effective uh, was triggered by a study, uh, a review, that looked at the literature on mindfulness approaches. And uh, although a number of the studies showed uh, an impact on weight, uh, they were not able to demonstrate that mindfulness was the active ingredient. So this is a key aspect of the research in mindfulness that we have to pay attention to. There are lots of components to you know, well-meaning uh, interventions, efforts to uh, change symptoms, improve health, well-being, and so on. Uh, and 
we have to be able to identify the key ingredients and know whether mindfulness itself is, is what's active and responsible for the outcomes that we see. The, um, our group uh, just completed and published uh, another review that took a more restrictive uh, view or definition of mindfulness-based approaches because uh, going back to the, to the MBSR sort of format uh, and model and, and programs like it, MBCT, as uh, uh, Nick was just talking about, uh, to call something mindfulness-based, we, we think that the, the uh, intervention has to involve teaching meditation practices, not just the idea of mindfulness and how to, how to develop some skills around applying it in certain situations. That there's an expectation during the intervention that the participants will learn to practice on their own. And that the teaching is done by people who have extensive experience with mindfulness, their own daily practice, meditation practice and formal training in meditation and the teaching of it. So one of the things that we discovered is that there are a lot of things that are being called mindfulness based. So the review that I just talked about included interventions, for example, that consisted of a single day workshop uh, that, did not involve, that did not actually include much mindfulness, but a single day. And that was one of the studies included in the results. Uh, others uh, had no formal meditation uh, training in law, and yet the title of the review was Mindfulness-Based Approaches to Weight Loss. So, so caution, I think, here in terms of the literature. But for the, number, for the studies that we did feel uh, actually focused on mindfulness-based interventions, the, the results are quite mixed. And that's both for obesity-related eating behaviors and for the actual impact on weight loss. Uh, another example of, of the kinds of interventions that were included in the previous study, a, uh, an intervention targeting women who eat too much when they go out to restaurants. So it was a mindfulness-based approach to restaurant eating. Um, so the... Um, and, and then one of the other issues that we found in the literature that, that was striking and hasn't really been commented on uh, in previous reviews is that the follow-up periods are very short. So if you think about what you're trying to do with a mindfulness-based intervention, where you're training people to become aware of long-standing habitual patterns of thinking and feeling and acting, and establish new patterns, I think it stands to reason that that's going to take time. And short follow-up periods are probably not going to be adequate to know what the real impact is. And there's precedence for this in mindfulness-based research. There are studies, for example, of people with chronic serious asthma from our institution, Lori Pieper's work, where uh, the separation between a, a very good attention uh, control intervention and MBSR for improving quality of life and symptoms of asthma in, in uh, these participants did not become <coughs> apparent until between 6 and 12 months after the intervention ended. So if they had ended their follow-up at four months, they wouldn't have seen the difference. There's a similar study of diabetes, patients with type 2 diabetes, that looks at uh, metabolic parameters of the disease and progression of the disease, where the difference did not become apparent until one year out. And I think this just makes sense if you know mindfulness and, and what, it, what it's cultivating and helping us to, to do. So, I like this um, slide, it's, this study, and, and I really recommend it if you're interested in the, we heard about the agenda for research uh, in pedagogy uh, this morning, and if you're interested in the, the agenda for research in, in health, the applications of mindfulness in healthcare, uh, I strongly recommend this review by Dimidjian and Siegel that came out just this past year. Because what they've done is they've taken the best literature on mindfulness-based interventions, they focused here on MBSR and MBCT, and they've mapped it onto what's called the NIH stage model. The field is at a point like the rest of behavioral uh, change research, where there's been a proliferation, and that's this darkest box here, stage one, a proliferation of interventions using uh, mindfulness in this case specifically, or behavior change in general. Lots of different efforts to show that a particular intervention can uh, change an outcome, usually based on self-report, usually with short follow-up periods, usually done uh, in non-real-world non settings. 
So there are lots of pre and post studies out there. There are lots of weightless control groups, treatment as usual controls, uh, even randomized controlled trials that are not really fully powered to be able to detect the kind of effect size that you need to see when you go to move into uh, community effectiveness trials later on. And that's why these other boxes are, are not shaded very dark or at all, because even with MDSR and MDCT, there's been very little of this done. And we won't really know about the real effectiveness of these interventions until these studies are done. And the argument that the NIH has made, so this has, there's a practical, pragmatic uh, point to be made here as well. The NIH has adopted this model as a guide for the kinds of uh, uh, RFAs that they're putting out for research studies and the way they're reviewing research studies. And this is very much what the uh, Science and Behavior Change Grant that, that uh, Dave referred to earlier is about that we're involved in, uh, the need to understand mechanisms of change so that we have reliable indicators of when an intervention is actually doing what we think it's supposed to do. So when you see a field where there's a lot of mixed results, like in the weight loss studies, some studies look very impressive, others not at all. And we don't know if uh, the intervention was done the same way. And one way to know is if we have markers like this. So these are the intervention targets that I'll be talking more about that we'd like to develop. And they come from the basic research. So basic, not in the sense of molecular biology, uh, it could, uh, but more broadly, biological research methods, psychological, uh, social uh, methods that get at mechanisms involved in a, a behavior and therefore uh, t potential targets for the intervention, for monitoring the impact of an intervention. The only example, the really, really the only good example we have of this in the mindfulness field is MBCT. And that's really a beautiful and elegant story. And it's worth spending a minute on because uh, Siegel, uh, Teasdale, and Williams uh, early on were cognitive behavior therapy researchers. And they knew from their studies that cognitive reactivity to low mood in a mood induction paradigm, when done with people who had had previous episodes of depression, was a very strong predictor of who would relapse at long-term follow-up, one to two years later. And it was the only predictor that, that we had, it's still the only predictor that we had. So the degree to which experiencing a low mood triggers dysfunctional and negative thoughts is, is the predictor. So that suggests, um, suggested to them a mechanism and also a target for the intervention. And that's when they came to UMass and they studied with John and learned MBSR and then began tweaking it and adapting it and bringing cognitive behavioral therapy into it to address uh, relapse uh, of depression. Be partly because that had such a clear mechanistic understanding, uh, we were able to get uh, reproducible findings very early on in this field with MBCT for preventing relapse, uh, reproducing results by multiple groups in multiple countries, not just the authors who developed the intervention. And now that's the, the only example really where uh, it's moved into the field of implementation research so that that's what's being done now in the UK and Australia and other places uh, because uh, they've progressed through these stages where they've demonstrated uh, efficacy in community clinics by non-research therapists. They've demonstrated in the latest publication on the PREVENT trial as this past summer uh, by Kaiken et al. Uh, in a real effectiveness study in the community. And now the work is being done on how to really implement it uh, effectively and make it sustainable. So that's the direction we want to go. That's sort of, this is sort of the roadmap that we'd like to have for research uh, on mindfulness-based interventions. And we have a long way to go with weight loss, but uh, I'll tell you how we're beginning to focus on this. So if you can't read the caption here, for the two women standing in front of the bakery, the patisserie, it's, uh, what do you eat for anxiety? <laughs> we believe that uh, eating behaviors related to obesity, uh, we know there are several different uh, types of eating behavior that are related to obesity, and it just stands to reason that obesity is a heterogeneous uh, condition, and that one size is not gonna fit all. Again, that, I definitely was not intended. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, that, but, um, but that interventions uh, will, be, will perform best if they're targeted at the particular mechanism involved. 
We're focusing on emotional eating. Uh, and we believe that the mechanism, which is defined as eating in response to negative emotion or emotional distress. Once you know that that pint of haagen or that box of donuts relieves your distress after a bad exam or a breakup or whatever, I made a beeline to the haagen in St. Louis at the medical school after the worst exams, uh, and it worked. But, you know, once you learn that, it becomes, it's a negative reinforcement. It's more likely to happen again, and it can become ingrained in the basal ganglia, as they've talked about, uh, as a habit. So that's an example of the automatic type behavior that we don't want, because then it's very hard to get out of it again and to change these long-standing habits. Uh, it can be triggered or potentiated by stress, like any uh, addictive type pattern. It's uh, associated in particular with, with intake of haagen-dazs, donuts. Highly palatable foods, calorie dense, high in sugar, fat, and salt. The worst stuff for you. Uh, and uh, importantly, in weight loss studies, when it's been looked at, it's a, it's a good predictor of who succeeds in weight loss, in, in achieving weight loss, and, and maintaining that weight loss. So we, we did a preliminary study um, with participants in the MBSR program at UMass where we administered these three questions about emotional eating. When I feel anxious, blue, or lonely, essentially, I, I eat or I eat the wrong foods. 332 participants. And uh, in the upper part here, you see that there's a significant difference from pre to post in emotional eating scores in the participants. This is just an observational study. It's not a controlled study. Uh, sort of a pilot study. But then when we broke it down into uh, two groups, those uh, normal weight and those overweight or obese, the difference is, is much more significant. And this is the group that's more likely to uh, have emotional eating problems, of course. So we then uh, sought to replicate this using a full um, scale for emotional eating called the in internal disinhibition scale. I won't go into why, but it's a very reliable, validated scale for emotional eating. <coughs> and here the important finding is that in people that could be classified as emotional eaters based on the baseline score, the effect was quite striking and negligible for those that were not, not emotional eaters. So, again, the idea that um, that subtypes may respond differently to a particular intervention. And here we're just talking about mindfulness-based stress reduction. There was nothing added to address weight loss or eating in particular. But it does obviously help with dealing with stress and the emotions that we think are involved in the mechanism of this particular problem and uh, reducing emotional reactivity. But this doesn't get us the target for the intervention that I was talking about earlier. So for that, I want to switch gears and I'm going to come back to this. And uh, we went to the basic science. So there's accumulating evidence that the amygdala and emotional reactivity are involved in emotional eating from basic science studies. Uh, this is one example from Eric Stice's group where they took women with bulimia who have a severe form of emotional eating and in the scanner showed them images of a highly palatable food, a chocolate cake, um, or a tasteless solution. And what they see is that uh, connectivity between, so this is actually a connectivity map using what's called effective functional connectivity. For the connectivity between amygdala and reward regions, this being the putamen, and, uh, and also the insula. Connectivity uh, was positively, was more strongly positively correlated uh, in these regions in uh, the women with emotional eating compared to controls, and for the palatable food cue compared to the tasteless solution. There's other types of evidence that the amygdala is, is involved in this. Connectivity between the amygdala and the reward center has been shown to mediate the finding that increased activation of the amygdala predicts long-term weight gain when uh, shown palatable food cues. So uh, we are focusing then on the amygdala in our studies in terms of identifying a target. And now I'm going to go back and um, uh, talk about the underlying principle here, which is neuroplasticity. When I was in medical school, we didn't, we didn't know about this. 
Uh, we thought mid-20s, it's done, brain's not changing, it's all downhill from there. <coughs> Bad news is it's still all downhill, um, but the brain can change. Uh, it may or may not help us. But the brain is a target for stress and also for interventions like mindfulness. This is just, these are actual drawings of neurons from the prefrontal cortex and the campus in, uh, from animal models of chronic stress showing that there's shrinkage and atrophy of, of dendrites in these regions uh, under conditions of chronic stress. And the opposite in the amygdala, which is the control center for the stress response and emotional reactivity uh, under conditions of chronic stress. You see a proliferation of dendrites and synapses. Uh, so differential effects depending on which part of the brain you're in. And prefrontal cortex and hippocampus are areas of the brain that control the amygdala response and the stress response and emotional reactivity. So it's a logical place to look in terms of the, the uh, actions of mindfulness in the brain. And Sarah with Lars, with Lars lab have done, have done an elegant study to do that. And here they've done a structural study, a structural imaging study, MRI study, of participants in MDSR program, work done by Britta Holzel and colleagues in Sarah's lab. And what they found is that uh, the decrease in volume in the amygdala, so remember the amygdala gets bigger with stress, uh, correlates with reductions in symptoms of perceived stress. The other reason I picked this example uh, in this particular study is it's one of the very few that we have, and this is important because we need more of these studies, it's one of the very few that we have that actually shows a relationship between a change in the brain and symptoms improvement. <coughs> No part of the brain works in isolation, of course. The brain is a system of networks. The amygdala is part of the emotion regulation or affective processing uh, network, which includes areas including the insula, which is responsible for the subjective awareness of emotional feelings, <coughs> areas of prefrontal cortex uh, involved in regulating the, the amygdala, and that's an oversimplification, but uh, <coughs> cognitive control of uh, uh, working memory, planning, goal setting, all, and so forth, uh, goes on. So we're particularly interested in, in, in this, looking at the networks that, uh, for the amygdala in the approach that we're taking. And we're using an approach, uh, a methodology called resting state fMRI. I'm out of time. Really? I missed the five minute cue, George. <laughs> I should have been paying more attention. Talking as fast as I can. All right. So um, neurons that fire together, wire together. Correlations between spontaneous activity in different parts of the brain demonstrate uh, the functional architecture, the connectivity between areas of the brain. And uh, you can map that connectivity uh, uh, with a statistic statistical techniques showing the correlation between one area of the brain and another. This is our data on uh, the first time we, the first attempt to look at this where we looked at connectivity between the amygdala and the orbitofrontal cortex. So here we're showing the, uh, the target region for that uh, connection, which shows a significant signal in the orbitofrontal cortex that um, is correlated uh, inversely with a negative emotion, trait anger, and positively with trait mindfulness using the Kim's score, which is a, a, a Kentucky inventory of mindfulness skills. We then looked at another group of subjects who went through the MBSR program. Again, we see, in this case, we're subtracting uh, out the baseline signal from the post uh, MBSR signal. And here we see a signal above that subtraction, significant above that subtraction, over the frontal cortex and insula. So this is, the, this is what we're targeting, uh, we're proposing in our hypotheses for a study of people of, who are uh, seeking to maintain weight loss. This is the paradigm. People are uh, scanned and administered surveys before being randomized to MBSR or a, a well-matched control condition. We're scanned again, uh, and then we're looking at weight loss maintenance at six months and 12 months. So, the hypothesis is that this change in amygdala connectivity uh, will predict outcomes. Uh, and we uh, don't have the results yet because we can't break the blind. We're still recruiting our last group of subjects, but I uh, hope to have that answer for you soon. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Fong. <coughs> Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lin is a distinguished professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Binghamton and the director of the psychological clinic. He is a licensed psychologist in independent practice and a diplomat in both clinical and forensic psychology. Dr. Lin has been the recipient of numerous professional awards, including the Chancellor's Award of the State University of New York for scholarship and creative activities, and awards from the American Psychological Association. Uh, he has published more than 340 articles in book chapters, and he has written or edited 24 books, many of which have received awards from professional organizations. He is the editor of the journal Psychology of Consciousness, Theory, Research, and Practice, and serves on 11 other editorial boards. His research has been funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, and he has consulted as an expert witness on hypnosis and memory on a national and international basis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lin. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. I know I have been to God and how did I speak? I don't think I have the number of microphones. Okay, can you? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the conference organizers and particularly Lisa for all of her work. I'm very honored uh, to be here. I was contacted. Uh, because someone who was organizing the conference uh, saw a couple of papers that I'd written in the area of mindfulness. And I immediately said yes, in part because I thought that it would be very nice to, to kind of give credit to students who had done a lot of research with me, and they are exemplars of students in our system now who have tremendous interest and passion for studying this topic. So my research presentation today will focus largely on their research. I consider them really co-authors of this, and I will acknowledge that. Let me give you a little bit of, uh, of credit where it's due. I'd like to thank our Evolutionary Studies Program and the Mind and Life Institute that David Brago is a part of. But let me give you a bit of history here. It might be helpful. Okay, so the person on the left is me. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, that's not who I am. That's how I looked in 1971 when I was struggling with whether I wanted to be a blues harp player in a blues band or continue on in graduate school. Now, when you have a choice like that to make, one possibility is you travel to India to figure these things out. And when I was in, I believe it was Yugoslavia, I met this guy over here. I don't know that anyone. Does anyone know who this guy is? Well, that's, that is Jeff Miller. And Jeff Miller uh, and I traveled to Afghanistan first, and then I went on to India, and he went on some time later. He went on a lot further. He, study with Dalai Lama, translated for the Dalai Lama, and is today the uh, highest ranking Western uh, Buddhist Lama. And his name now, he goes by Islam Suryas. Also known as the Dalai Lama, because he's Jewish. That's what he's known as. <laughs> and I highly recommend his book, Awakening the Buddha Within. And we we're friends today, and from that time, I developed an interest in meditation and mindfulness. But it kind of like fell off for some time, until my students, I mean, I, I read this, but research-wise, it was my students who got me into uh, supervising their research, because they became passionate about this, because this is really sweat psychology, and in a positive way. Uh, and that it is now a very viable alternative among many practitioners uh, for cognitive behavioral therapies and or it is used to augment 
or at least accompany these therapies. So let me quickly, because I want to cover a lot of ground, go through some of the research we've done. And I'd like to, to kind of center this on some questions. Uh, first one would be, can facets of mindfulness predict depressive symptoms over the course of the semester? Can we identify some of the mechanisms of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which Carl alluded to, as have others? Uh, does an acceptance style of coping facilitate personal growth following sexual assault? And finally, can mindfulness and acceptance skills be used to improve body image? In other words, can we incorporate uh, these skills into a more encompassing program? So first question, can facets of mindfulness predict depressive symptoms over the course of the academic semester? Uh, well, we did rely on, on self-reports. We do not have a magnet. We're, we're trying to get one very desperately. Uh, I go out on the weekends and I sell high enough ice cream to raise money for, but it's going to be a lot. So we assess college students' mindfulness skills with the five facet mindfulness <coughs> questionnaire. Uh, and these facets are acting with awareness, non-reactivity, non-judging, describing, and observing. We also administer the back depression inventory. This research uh, was done by um, Sean Barnes. And we studied 102 participants. We test them in groups. Uh, we tested them different times in the academic quarter. First, in the second and third week, then we retested them during the ninth or tenth week, which was the time of mid midterms, kind of a, a stressful time. And then during the 14th or 15th week, which was finals period. And uh, this is our correlation table, and I don't want to overwhelm you with, with science here, but basically, uh, as as we predicted, acting with awareness, non-reactivity, and non-judging were negatively related to depressive symptoms over the course of the entire academic semester. However, in contrast, observing was directly related to depressive symptoms in time one and two, and the mindfulness skill of describing was not related to symptoms at all of the time sampled during the semester. So we could see that some of the mindfulness skills came into play in terms of these uh, correlational relationships. Oops. And we can see these uh, kind of uh, moderate, um, oops, I'm going to have time this, moderate correlations at, at time one for those three variables, time two at point three, time three, a little stronger, time three, for uh, what is that that would be, be non-judging. So then we, uh, we looked at a statistical model that considered all four of these mindfulness skills simultaneously. And non-reactivity and non-judging skills seem to underpin the negative relation between mindfulness and uh, depressive symptoms across all of the times assessed. So again, we can see what um, uh, Dr. Fulwab was talking about, non-reactivity comes into play here. So it's not only observing, it's observing but not reacting to the stream of consciousness, to what you are observing that seems to be impactful. So, second question, can we identify some of the mechanisms of MBCT? You've heard descriptions of, of MBCT. I won't uh, review them, but basically um, it, it promotes a shift in the relation to negative thoughts by teaching folks to observe thoughts and feelings that is temporary, objective events in the mind, as opposed to uh, reflections of the self that are necessary. And we talked about this at various points in this conference as diffusion. Basically, what I think of it, it is allowing a thought to be a thought, distancing, and, and not buying into it, not overvaluing it, not giving it in too much play in your life. That is a thought. So if you think you're worthless, it doesn't mean you are worthless. You don't have to identify with that struggle. Okay, so um, this was a study, again, uh, conducted with Sean and several of my other students, and this was supported by my wife. So uh, lots of empirical support for it. I'll just buy that. Um, this was a, a small study. It, it was probably underpowered study, but we did find some interesting things. We had 22 to weightless folks, 18 MBC folks um, randomized there from the community. They were not college students. 
uh, males and females, mostly females, 95% Caucasian, mean age 46, a long episode, 16 months, medium number of previous episodes were three. I believe that three was our selection criteria, minimum of, of three. And folks with no more than mild depression, so what do we find? The participants in the MBC condition were less depressed on the BDI at the end of, of treatment. We also looked at, at cognitive activity. This is, I think, where a lot of the action is, really. And uh, we assessed this in response to a seven-minute negative mood induction, in which we played sad music and we asked people to think sad thoughts. And we measured it as the difference between how people uh, responded to the induction and their scores of a measure of dysfunctional attitudes after the induction versus prior to the induction. And um, what we found was, uh, was kind of an interesting group in interaction where participants who received the treatment, uh, evidence less kind of reactivity following uh, the treatment than the weightless participants. But interestingly, this action was, was driven uh, largely by a non-significant reduction in cognitive reactivity from 0.1 to 0.2, but an increase, a rather sharp increase in cognitive reactivity through the wait list control. So it's possible that that it prevent it would prevent further depressive episodes. We also looked at some self-report measures and the uh, five facet of my questionnaire, there were significant increases in non-judging of inner experience pre uh, treatment uh, versus post in the MDCT group, but not in the uh, weightless group. And we also found interesting differences in um, decentric, specifically decreases as a function of treatment. So here we see some evidence, it's preliminary evidence, of changes in very much underlying MDCT uh, proposed mechanisms of actions following treatment. Now, I, I think a really interesting and well replicated finding is as many as two thirds and more of sexual assault survivors report that they found ways to grow or find meaning following the assault. And this is called post traumatic growth or PTG, as I will abbreviate it. And so even after an assault, Folks can find some reasons to learn from the experience, take something away from it, take meaning from it. And what we found in another study, and I thought this was quite interesting, there's more post-traumatic growth associated when people experience more symptoms of PTSD and more distress, not less. So we were interested in looking at the question of what's the relationship between acceptance and uh, post-traumatic growth. And, and in some very early correlational studies, we found a correlation between acceptance and mindfulness of, of 0.61. So what are the, are the predictors of, of, PT, uh, of PTG and outcomes among 296 women? 51% uh, of, of these women reported they were raped, and we use measures of, of hardiness and uh, resilience as well as uh, post-traumatic growth. And um, we looked at two classes of measures, measures of acceptance of the experience uh, and measures of avoidance. Uh, items uh, off the brief scale for acceptance would be, I've been learning to live with it, I've been accepting the reality of the fact that it happened, and uh, exemplars of avoidance would be things like, I've been turning to work or other activities to take my mind off things, or I've used alcohol or drugs to help me get through it. So when we look at this correlation table, what we can see is that acceptance coping is highly correlated with post-traumatic growth reports of our uh, a correlation point seven six, and avoidance coping as we would, accept, uh, would we would accept expect is negatively correlated at minus point three eight. But note here that disclosure of assault is not significantly correlated with acceptance or with avoidance coping. All right, so these findings are, um, are also consistent with uh, previous studies. I think it's, it's fascinating that 
of participants who reported at least some degree of PTG, and 18 uh, percent who reported uh, considerable. And so acceptance and uh, acceptance coming and highness accounted for only 36 percent, 37 percent of the variability in uh, PTG. But equally, I think, interesting is that a soft severity, victimization, history, self-blame, and self-disclosure of assault are not predictors of uh, PTSD. At the same time, there is a modest correlation uh, between post-traumatic growth and PTSD symptoms. So this suggests to us, and we have not tested this, we would like to uh, test it, uh, that acceptance and mindfulness of approach may be useful in treating um, uh, PTSD. Now, in our next effort, I'd like to describe how mindfulness and, and acceptance can be incorporated into a more encompassing treatment, as I indicated. And I think that this, uh, this program is an illustration of a program that uh, we developed that is conducted in, in groups. It focuses on pressures women face in society to be thin, of which there has been some allusion to this. And what's different about it, really, is how it incorporates mindfulness, as you will see. And I conducted this with Amanda Simons. And we selected uh, college women with mild to severe body dissatisfaction based on a body shape questionnaire. Um, and we excluded people with eating disorders. Yeah. Uh, we compared students on a wait list and a 40 with mindfulness and acceptance training. And given that I only have five minutes, I will cruise through this. Uh, so we developed this, uh, and it's a multifaceted interaction. And I'm actually going to show you some slides. Uh, we start off, uh, why are you here? What are we going to be doing? We talk about education, the thin ideal, and the role of this in body images. And we say we're going to teach folks skills uh, uh, to tackle the effects of immediate influences on body satisfaction and teach them mindfulness techniques. We define what body image is, picture of our own body, which we focus in our mind as to say the way in which the body appears to ourselves. And we talk about this as being multidimensional. It's not just one dimensional, it encompasses perceptual, behavioral, and, and um, attitudinal evaluation. So um, here's what we're going to do. We start off with the role of the, the media, the problem, the media, uh, media's saturation. And we ask people, there's a lot of interaction here. What messages do you think the media sends? Uh, and what sources are most influential? We go over media stereotypes. Uh, we show them pictures of of, of runway models, and uh, you might think that that's going to make people more uh, more concerned about, but, but actually studies that focus in on this component have been shown to be somewhat effective. And um, we talk about how this ideal is unattainable, and um, we show that uh, the research on this kind of exposure leads to multiple problems, increased body satisfaction, negative mood states, decreased self-esteem and eating disorder symptoms. We say the thin ideal is unreal. And one way we illustrate this is with photographs, actually. Uh, 1969, you can see a photo of the uh, Three Graces by uh, Rubens, 1887, a Renoir photograph, 1920s, and you can see they're getting thinner and thinner, right? Thin, short hair flappers considered attractive. And we have Marilyn Monroe, size 14, the fitness craze induced but enhanced female form. And then we get this ridiculous uh, standard of the incredibly skinny woman. And then we go through body perception, early influence, and we show them pictures of the kinds of, of thin, uh, thin figures that kids are exposed to that have also changed through time. Talk about the impossible standard. Uh, models are thinner than 98 percent of the population. The average model is 5'11", uh, weighs 170 pounds. In reality, the average person is 5'4", and weighs about 140. And moving on, we talk about how 75 percent of women think they're overweight, and 90 
for example, of women overestimate their body size. So where does mindfulness come in? Well, right about now, we uh, define it, we talk about how it might be helpful, then we get into acceptance, and uh, one of the most interesting aspects of the program is mirror exposure. How many of you have heard of mirror exposure? Uh, this it is done, uh, in this case, in a group where, where, the, um, where an assistant demonstrates how she stands in front of a, a mirror. And she details her image from head to toe. And um, the point is to look at the reflection in each part, but describe out loud all the features and be objective, not judgmental or evaluative. That's really key. And uh, one minute of uh, silence, they describe the body in non evaluative terms long, short, proportional, uh, wide, narrow, texture, smooth, rough, a shape, round, oval, square, musculature, color. And we tell them that this is actually an empirically established procedure that leads to, to uh, good things for them, less depression, less body dissatisfaction, and increased self-esteem. Now this is a form of mindfulness because other thoughts come and go as they are going through this exercise. Second session, and I'll make this quick. Um, people come one, one by one and stand in front of the mirror and focus first on two random body parts, two, three minutes, and, um, and, and we challenge them to see what they're, get to what they're really thinking. Um, and then they attend uh, to breathing, moment, to moment awareness, go from that to this exercise. Then uh, the next part is a brief introduction to uh, a mindfulness, remaining done, um, uh, non judgmental, observe, acknowledge, identify thoughts, feelings, and assumptions, uh, remind themselves about uh, limitations of assumptions, and be mindful of their reactions. So we don't emphasize change, we we'll go through two exercises a body scan and uh, role playing. So most of you are familiar with body scan. Instructions is to be non-judgmental as you go through every part of the body. And uh, the uh, presenter takes turns role-playing women who are judgmental. Then the audience uh, comes in, challenges the assumptions, and works through that uh, with people. It kind of winds up with a, a body scan and closing statements. Again, there's lots of interaction. And when we look at the effectiveness, we see that there is at the end of treatment, and uh, treatment at, at, at time one is, there are, are one month and two months followed. It's not a very extended follow-up, but there's some follow-up. And we do find decreased body dissatisfaction and less dietary restraint um, at one month and, and two month intervals uh, compared with pre-treatment baseline. So we have lots of other ongoing studies going, going with students, trying to uh, deconstruct or dismantle to loving kindness meditation, separating out loving kindness directed toward the self, toward others, and a combined condition. And a very interesting finding is that it may be necessary to extend the loving kindness aspect, piece of this to others, because we're finding that people who get loving kindness instructions for the self are actually less likely to volunteer to give some, to donate their experimental plans to other students. And it's quite a significant effect based on very preliminary data. But the instructions to be loving, kind toward other people seem to, to increase altruism, whether it's selfish or strategic or, or not. That seems to be holding up right in the midst of this. And uh, I guess I'll stop here for time constraints. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. So, in the interest of time, uh, I would like to open up the panel to the audience for questions. And just keep in mind that the closing session will be right after this one. There will be no break between the session and the closing session. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Jamie. I'm an undergraduate um, researcher at the College of Rockford. This question is for Dr. Lin. Um, so my undergraduate honors thesis is on right here. Sorry, I'll stand up. Um, my undergraduate honors thesis is on post-traumatic growth. And I'm glad that you actually mentioned that because throughout this conference, I'm thinking I wonder if mindfulness has a role in post-traumatic growth. Um, I'm wondering what uh, measurement did you use to measure post-traumatic growth? Uh, it, it was a benefits value scale, and, uh, and I'm blocking on the author's name, but it's, it's uh, maybe Crystal Park scale. Uh, it's a widely used scale. I can give you that information. Uh, I actually used the post traumatic growth inventory. I think it was. Yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. I think it was Calhoun uh, 2000. Yeah. Um, did, did you, I don't think I saw the analysis up there, but there's five, I believe, five facets of post traumatic growth um, appreciation of life, personal strength spiritual change, uh, relating to others, there's another one that I'm liking out. Um, was mindfulness related to any of those facets in particular? I don't, I don't think we use that scale because okay. I, I do not remember uh, correlation with mindfulness. Okay. Uh, we looked at, at the cope and um, acceptance primarily for that, but not mindfulness there. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking because I'm, I'm working on possible um, writing this manuscript for uh, my undergraduate thesis, and right. we're thinking of other factors that can relate to post traumatic growth. And I also found that severity of the trauma, which in the situation with bullying, um, was related to levels of post traumatic growth. Interesting, too. So that and bullying is a, a great topic. Yeah, and same Good thing with the, the, the PTSD symptoms. We also found that as well. So. It's always nice to be replicated. Yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah. You know, as I listen to this, I, I wonder if the mindfulness uh, research, and I think David Vail touched on this, do we have enough uh, of a standard approach to call something mindfulness, and even our teachers' mindfulness? I mean, if a person goes through mindfulness, even an MBSR program that it sounds like it's relatively defined, uh, would there not be possibly a difference in the teacher? Uh, is there much certification for this, or uh, how, how is the Center for Mindfulness, uh, you know, is that a reasonable question, and are, are you dealing with it one way or another? It's a reasonable question, a very reasonable question. It's a real challenge to the field, and um, uh, so Judd Brewer at the Center for Mindfulness is working with Fred Hecht and others on a grant that I hope they get where they're going to look at exactly the kind of question you're asking about in the systematic, empirical way. Um, it's something we need to understand. Uh, Alyssa Eppel has shown with her, uh, she's done uh, mindfulness-based approaches to uh, weight loss studies and uh, uh, one of the interesting findings is that she gets significant variability between the teachers, even though they have similar, you know, uh, years of training and expertise. And um, and, it's, and and she thinks it has to do with with um, how strictly they adhere to the protocol. Um, now, remember, there isn't a manual for MBSR, as as Dave said. John has always uh, not wanted that. The MBCT guys immediately wrote the protocol. They wrote the book, right? So we, we can be more confident that it's being done similarly each time if you follow that and you have the right kind of training and background. Um, but you lose something as well. So MBSR teachers will say you have to adapt the teaching to the class and the personalities, the, the, the dynamics in the class, and, and the, that's part of the teaching from your practice, which I totally get. And um, so it is, it is a real challenge, uh, but Having said that, so certification is important. The Mindfulness Center uh, has, has a rigorous certification program, and we're working with other training programs, like in the UK, to um, have uh, coherent uh, criteria uh, for certifying and developing measurable objective criteria for knowing when somebody's reached a certain expertise. Thank you, and I think that would have to be it. Thank you everyone for uh, being part of this very wonderful uh, panel. I think you'll agree with me the wealth of information we've been presented today. Thank you. Thank you.